I feel like on this episode, we should have like musical intro or something like that. But if I just say I want to be down with the king, then I probably sound a little corny. But our guest doesn't. Daryl DMC McDaniels joins us on The Pulse today. It is my pleasure, sir. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me, man. This, this is, I'm DMC in a place to be, and this is the place to be. No doubt. Always. Man, I, I, I don't know. and this, I'm sure you've been doing this for a minute, so this isn't as big a deal to you. But I'm really loving this show because I just get to talk to people that I've sat back forever. You know, I mean, I had the Adidas. I tried to rock the sweatsuits and the hats. I mean, I was corny, but I tried to do all that. Um, right. So I just enjoy that, and I appreciate you taking the time out. Yeah, no, you, you, time. you wasn't corny at all. You was part of it. You know, a lot of people think hip-hop is something that is based on a celebrity status. I can only watch it and listen to it, but that's not true. The whole purpose and culture of hip-hop is to knock down the walls that separate us, allow you to say who you are, where you're from, and what you're about, and me to say the same, th- me to say the same thing, and then say where can we go from here? So what we was doing, what Run DMC was doing, we really didn't do nothing, and I say that a lot and at a lot of events or award shows, and people, what do you mean Run DMC this? But if you listen to what I said on my Adidas, we took the beat from the street and we put it on TV. For all the seat. You guys put out the plan and the roadmap, and people in a exactly. lot of ways can follow it. What was it like for you? Like, take us back a little bit, because the roadmap wasn't there when oh, you were it doing no it. Roadmap. it. It was no roadmap. Um, one of the things that I tell the young people of this generation, you will always have, <coughs> excuse me, you will always have people that doubt you. You remember, they didn't, They thought hip-hop was going to be a fad. So there was a lot of uh, adversity. There was a lot of denial. But um, our thing was, no matter what they say or what they think, just get out there and do the thing that you love to do. We opened for Marvin Gaye. We opened for Parliament Funkadelic. We opened for ZZ Top. We opened for Lou Reed. So we was... Um, thrust in some very unfamiliar territory. But we knew what I did in my basement, what I did in the parking at the block party, if, if, if people in my neighborhood can enjoy it and feel it, we know people in other states and people around the world is going to feel it. We didn't have access to studios. Yeah, We didn't have instruments. So we had to take the vinyl wreckage recorded by all the great soul, jazz, rock, R&B artists. And we had to find a little break where nobody was saying nothing. In that little space, we was able to tell our stories. So in the beginning, though, it was so much denial. Oh, um, this will never work. It'll never be an official part. Of- Nobody's going to respect it. They said it's going to die quicker than disco. So everybody knows Run DMC, right? But I don't think everybody knows that story and it's not the industry's not the same now now you can pick up your phone and you've created a song oh you guys you had to grind right you're performing in the neighborhood you're performing in the basement yes walk us through that our first year in the business was performing for free we would show up to venues we would show up we had to wreck it out now there was so much going against us because remember it's not like today I tell these young kids, hip hop wasn't on the radio 24 hours, seven days a week. It was only on Friday and Saturday night. And you had to have something creative and interesting to get Mr. Magic or Red Alert or the awesome tool, the Supreme Team to play your song in the first place. I'm not saying it's easy now, but it's a little easier now because everybody sounds the same and does the same thing. We wasn't having that. If Running Them was doing rock, and he was using James Brown, and they were using funk. You was all about your loan, figuring out what can I do to have my presentation. When we started getting booked for the shows, we would literally show up backstage to the Coliseum in Virginia, knock on the door. We the opening act, and they would open the door and slam the door shut on us. Because remember, it was no videos, it was yeah. no um, album covers. Everything was a single. So to make to um, to, to explain what was going on. There was no recognition. People were hearing the records, but there was no, what are they, who are they, this and that. So there was a lot of denial in the beginning. But all we said was, 
just give us our little 15 minutes. If you have one song, if you have one four minute and 30 second record, that four minute and 30 second records was your time, your moment to prove to whoever was in front of you that you was worth something to be respected as a Stevie Wonder or a Diana Ross. I, so I grew up, quick story, I grew up in radio. My father, rest his soul, was a manager of WDAS-FM here in Philadelphia. That's a legendary legend. And I remember, and they still tell the stories, Patty Jackson, Lady B, all those Lady people B. tell the stories about how he initially was not down with playing rap. And so they had launched that Saturday night show. Yep. You know, you yep. have the party animals. The DJs would be in there actually spinning. And you guys yes. did the tours and went to the stations and a lot of times had to prove yourself to the actual station. I think one of the things that allowed us to break through, um, to, to break down some of that doubt was when people, especially the radio stations, the program directors, the elders, mm -hmm. the critics and the journalists, when they started listening to what we was writing, because in the beginning, the misconception was it's going to be negative. It's going to be profane. It's going to be violent and this and that. But when, you know, I think Run DMC was the game changer because, you know, Ice T and people like that said, yo, man, these guys made positivity gangster. Our idols were Marvin Gaye and Stevie Wonder and Bob Dylan and John Lennon. So not only did we sample and steal their music, <laughs> we came from an age where you could pick up an album and read about the artist. So we was like, wow, Stevie Wonder said, you gotta be responsible with your music. You know what I'm saying? So that was one of the things that we, so you know, from Marvin Gaye doing what's going on to James Brown doing Say It Loud, Black and I'm Proud, and from Stevie Wonder just doing Inner Visions and everything amazing that he did, we knew we had a responsibility if we wanted to step on the stage after those greats. Was there any point that you fathomed 40 million records, half a billion streams now as things have evolved? Right, right. No, That's crazy. Right. That's Did you amazing. ever think of that when you're in the basement or doing the tour or having the door of the arena slammed on you? That's a great question. The main goal from an industry success standpoint was to have your record played Friday or Saturday night. <laughs> and when that happened with us like that in Sucker of Seas, true story, I made it, I'm done, <laughs> done. We had no idea it was gonna spread from New York across the country and then across the world. But the real famous people to, in, to us young people in this hip hop generation in our neighborhoods was the Grandmaster Flashes and the Funky Four Plus One and Cool Mo D and the Treacherous Three and Africa Bambana and the Soul Sonic Force. They were like our heroes because, you know, especially those young boys and girls from the Bronx, the Bronx was burning. The Bronx was like Vietnam. They had nothing, but they gave us hope and joy with this new culture they created.